this week on the Back Table Podcast. Well, I, I think that where it comes to equipment, it would be, um, I, I remember having a yellow pad of paper. I think this was circa 2013, where I decided I started off the bat thinking I'm going to learn equipment because I did what everybody else does, which is I'm going to start with what piece of equipment should I buy? And I went to GE, I went to Philips, I went to Zeem, I went to Siemens, and I had all these detailed notes on all of the different bells and whistles and just everything. And by the time I got to the end of the list, the beginner of the list had a new piece of equipment. And so I just basically could have gone around and around and around trying to sort out every little thing about every piece of equipment. And, it, and I'd probably still be writing on a yellow pad of paper, not having moved along if I didn't just say, forget it. I'm just picking one, closing my eyes and picking one. So I guess the advice would be don't have FOMO over your equipment and go to as many different labs as you can see as you can and touch and feel everything and then you'll know what to buy hello everyone and welcome to the back table podcast your source for all things interventional and endovascular you can find all previous episodes of our podcast on itunes spotify and backtable.com whether you're opening acquiring expanding or equipping your asc or obl Back your business with the knowledge and experience of Siemens Health and Years. Their consulting services bring the right experts to the table for a custom roadmap to success. They have a design and construction team who align with local and state outpatient building requirements, always with optimized patient workflow in mind. They've got a broad portfolio of capital equipment and exclusive industry partnerships give you access and preferred pricing to devices, accessories, IT, and staffing. Plus, Siemens Financial Services offers custom financing solutions designed specifically with the outside the hospital facility in mind. You know where your ASC or OBL is going. Work with Siemens Health and Ears to get there. This is Aaron Fritz as your host this week. I'm very excited to introduce my special guests, um, good friends and colleagues, Dr. Mary Constantino and Dr. Goke Ekawande. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Our audience is familiar with, with Mary. She's been on the show before. Although it's been a while, Mary, um, I was just holding up my 100th episode glass uh, where you were uh, the, our guest host and, and it's been, you know, that was last, that was December, 2020. So it's been almost a full year. Thanks for coming back, Mary. Thanks for having me on obviously what I consider a very important topic. Yeah. And Goke, thank you for coming on for, for the first time. I appreciate you wearing the, the swag. Got to go hard your first, the first time. So <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. So I just, I, I just want to do a quick intro. Um, for those who don't are familiar with you guys on social media, can you just uh, give us a quick intro of where you're at, where you've been, kind of how you got there? Mary, we'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I have the more boring of the two stories, but I've been in our OB, out, outpatient space for maybe nine or 10 years and in an OBL actually functioning operating for three years after three to four to five years of planning and one year of construction. And it's good. All the highs and lows and pluses and minuses. And um, I met Goke a long time ago at OEIS and it's just been so fun to watch him do his thing. Thank you. And um, my story is basically, so I started out as an academic faculty at uh, Barnes Jewish Wash U. And I started out as uh, basically doing, you know, obviously m mostly clinical work, but I had protected time for research. And, you know, so we studied a transarterial delivery of different um, cancer nanoparticles and therapeutics. And then I, um, for various reasons, I decided uh, to kind of venture into this wild, wild west of OBL space. So I went from all the way academic, like real hardcore academic and then I went all the way to a solo practitioner so it's so I have a lot of like uh, I get a lot of calls from people because they're like battling with the same type of questions because they're maybe in academics and you know maybe they feel like they're a failure for going into um, the private practice uh, space but so I, I I tend to do a lot of um, cuddling and um uh, mentorship <laughs> for, for that. But, um, but I met Mary, uh, I actually, I actually watched her stuff at, she, she doesn't like when I say this cause she, she says it makes her feel old, but I, I don't think so. I mean, I watched her stuff in 2013 in New Orleans and, um, I was like, you know, this is really cool. And, you know, every time I would always like look for her lectures or her, her talks on topics of, of being independent in IR. And I, I fundamentally believe in in IR independence and um, 
delivery of healthcare. So I'm excited to, to do this podcast. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. And does any of your practice still include in hospital work or are you completely outpatient? So I, I would say about 10%. Well, I'll say about 10%. There is a, a kind of like a, um, indigenous, um, if you will, for, for lack of a better, better phrase, hospital in St. Louis that I, I, I have privileges at and I, I give services to. Um, it has a lot of issues um, with um, a lot of, I think a, a lot of uh, for-profit companies are trying to buy it and maybe trying to offload it. And, you know, this goes into deeper into topics of health disparities and stuff, which I, I was just on a call yesterday, GEMS program call on, and I, I don't want to rehash it, but uh, but basically um, a lot of at need patients in that hospital, patients that really need care, patients with no insurance, Medicare, Medicaid. And um, I do a lot of, um, I do PAD work there, but most of my practice um, is in the outpatient space. So yes, yeah, so I, I do service that hospital. I, I do pick lines and stuff like that for them, but also I have a, um, limb salvage clinic there, um, which kind of, and every patient I get from there, I usually keep at the hospital. Uh, I don't hold them out because I think the hospital needs to, needs to survive. So that's why I do that. Can I jump in here, even though it's not on equipment? This, this is really important what um, Goke is doing. And there's this notion that people in the OBL just want to go atherize, do atherectomy and make a lot of money. And really, we have a healthcare delivery model, which we think addresses so many issues. And we can address disparity in healthcare. We can address who and when and how should be rightfully treated and in ways that save the country kajillions of dollars and do things safely and effectively and efficiently. And you'll see people like Goke in hospitals doing basically charitable work when he doesn't need to. And it, this idea that OBL people just want these great lives and make a lot of money and anybody not in OBL is doing the quote real work is just not true. And what Goki is doing is on his own. I mean, I didn't even know that you were really doing that much anymore. And um, I do the same thing covering call at a hospital. So in this whole exclusivity OBL hospital conflict, I just think we all need to take a step back and realize we're all trying to do the best things. And one person's cooking an Italian meal and one person's cooking a Mexican meal. We're both trying to feed the people, you know? And so it's just important to, I think, step back to all interventional radiologists really be on the same playing field. Yeah. Anyway, side note, not having anything to do with equipment, but no, um, right. I think that if you start asking people in OBLs what else they do, you're going to find a lot of the work that Goki is doing, people doing things like Goki is doing. And not to put any more suggestions about another topic, but that would be a great topic to talk about is uh, healthcare delivery and access to care and health disparities. Uh, I'll, I'll be more than glad to um, do that talk, but we can talk about, you know, what we're here to talk about. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, because I hadn't even introduced the, the topic yet today, which is all about equipment decisions. And in this OBL setting, and, and both of you guys started out as independent people. And so I, I, know, and I know you guys have given a lot of talks at conferences about uh, building an OBL successfully. But, you know, we all know that there's a lot of challenges that go with that. But we want to talk about, and I have some friends going through this right now, is how do you choose what equipment? And I, I went through it briefly uh, as, as an o, you know, part of an OBL. And so what I wanted, to, like the way to kind of dive into this, the first question I wanted to ask was, what was kind of the most challenging aspect of transitioning from that hospital mindset where you have these, uh, you know, you, you have like a cath lab with uh, a fixed system and you, you, know, you tend to have better, you know, pretty good equipment. How do you go from that mindset to an outpatient setting? And where do you even start? I'll start with you, okay? So I would say that, you know, it's, it's obviously a concern. You know, when I was leaving my hospital job and going into an outpatient setting, it was definitely a big concern. I was fortunate that initially my initial transition was from the hospital to, I got a clinic and then I was kind of leasing space in an OBL, local OBL, and they had a fixed unit. So I was actually excited. But then um, when I started the OBL, I was like, you know, this costs about two or three times more. Actually, it doesn't really have to cost that much if you get like refurbished equipment. And I think Mary can talk more about that. But I wanted to, to basically have the most economically savvy way to get into the OBL space. And so the first thing I thought about was what kind of C-arm am I going to buy? And I said, so I, I kept going back, said, you know, I can do a leg on any C-arm. 
there are debates about that, but the biggest thing I was concerned about was, do I have enough radiation and penetration um, to do my big UFI patients? And so I actually reached out to some people on Twitter, but basically it came down to two pieces of uh, two C arms. So, so basically what I looked for, what I looked for was the currents, the, uh, you know, how much current you had. And so I wanted the the most powerful system. When it came down to it, it was Siemens and, um, and Zeem. And they had the highest current. It could get down to 250 MA. And then um, you look at the KV, obviously, for the penetration. So, so then I was like, okay, how much support do I have? Um, and I had, you know, I went on um, SIR Connect. I went on different websites or, or different forums and I asked people in conferences what their thoughts were with Zeem. And most people said they had, didn't have good support outside of a major city like Chicago or New York city or whatever. So that's what made me choose the equipment that I have right now. So, yeah, so, so basically I, I thought about it in depth. Um, I have a good friend of mine who's an interventional cardiologist. He didn't think as hard. He just picked one. He picked up a GE system. I, because I'm an, I'm an interventional radiologist and I actually did physics. I became more neurotic about it and I wanted to have the, the most powerful system I can get in, in a C arm. So that's why I chose what I chose. So I just want to interject here. I have a text from May of 2028 of 2018 from Goke. Can you do a UFI with a C-arm? If so, what unit should I buy? Or is everyone using fixed units? That was at 5.50 a.m. And at 7.28 a.m., I said, that's a big debate. Those who have C-arms say that they are fine, except for those who have fixed units say that fix is unnecessary. Try Zeme, Siemens, or Philips Symphony Suite. Go, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> right you here. were one of the people that responded <laughs> and also um, Dr. Spencer. <laughs> so two people Aww, responded. Aw, the ladies in the house. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Nurturing. We're nurturing yeah. our, we're, we're nurturing the OBL world. Mary, I, I want to hear your point on this, but just real quick. Okay. Was it difficult to, to transition from a fixed unit, you know, assuming that's what you had in the hospital to this mobile C-arm setting, like using that? Yes. So the first thing I noticed was, you know, your, your images are not as good. So for sure, they're not as good. So it takes kind of getting used to it. Like, you, you know, you, ex, you almost expect a poorer image. So you have to turn the lights, you know, dim the lights, which I never used to do before. You have to cone in. Um, so you got to be creative. And also it, you do have to increase. I found this with UV patients. I just basically use full contrast when in the hospital, I probably would mix them, mix them 50, 50. So those are little nuances you have to do. I, I do think in general, uh, a fixed unit is better for sure. You can do things with a with a uh, C arm, but you have to make adjustments. The other thing about about these the C arm is that you know the table that comes with it is basically like an IDI table or a still a table. Those are the best tables you can, money can buy. However, at, when patients are heavy, it's it's hard to kind of move it. Whereas every time I go to a fixed unit, I feel like it's more ergonomic. I feel like you know I'm not as beat down after the case. So in a situation where you're doing a lot of legs, which is going back to my initial statement that you can do anything, you know, if you're doing legs, you can use any C arm. The problem is that you need very, very good um, longitudinal throw in your, in your C arm table. And you also need a longer table and you just can't get that with, with the tables that come with C or, or that you buy for your C arms. Whereas with a, with a fixed unit, you got longer tables, lo you know, longer longitudinal throws, transverse throws. It makes a leg procedure a lot easier. And that's what I found. And so just to clarify, so like a fixed unit usually comes with the table, right? Whereas a C arm, you're buying the table separate from the C arm, right? Um, and what about injectors? Do those tend to come with the C arm or do you have to again, buy that separately? So you have to buy, you have to buy the injector separately. I bought yeah. one and I have not used it. So if anyone wants one, um, just, um, DM That's me, cool. uh, yeah. but, uh, but I've never used it because it's just, it's too much work. It's right. It's, it's uh, so I use an extension to, uh, I, I, I connect an extension tubing and I kind of go as far as possible. And then I also use wrap pad. So, yeah. so it cuts down my radiation dose significantly. Cool. Mary, since you've gone through this whole process and I believe you're in the process of buying a, a fixed unit, right? Or, or installing? Installing, yes. Yeah. I mean, buying and installing. And so, yeah. Can you <laughs> give us, can you give the guests an idea of like the cost difference? Because I know you started with, with a C-arm. Now you're, you're, you're upgrading with a fixed unit. Can you t give us our audience a little bit idea of like what the cost difference is and, and the pros and cons? Yeah. So the fixed unit's going to be in another lab. 
that um, we're building. So it's not, yeah. I'm still going to be using the C-arm, unfortunately, for a little bit. You know, I think, so uh, the cost difference, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, put it that way, <laughs> like enough to cause you to pause. Otherwise, we yeah. would all get a fixed unit. So right. when you're making the decision of fixed unit and C-arm, if you can, I would go for a fixed unit. If you're two doctors, three doctors, four doctors, get a fixed unit. I think where it becomes a challenge is if you're a single provider, you know, a several hundred versus a $1 million unit becomes a big deal. So if you're living on minimum wage and you can buy a used Honda Civic versus a like a six seater, you know, Audi A7, that becomes a bigger deal, you know? So I think that... um the single provider really is the challenge. I think if you're in a group, then there's really no debate. It's a fixed unit, my mind. And this this has not changed. This conversation has not changed in 10 years. And I don't think yeah. it will. It's gotten a little bit easier because the fixed units are less expensive. Like equipment costs really are a lot less expensive now than it used to be. But then the same conversations are always happening about what if reimbursement rates go down and blah, 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 all that other stuff. So I think if you can get a fixed unit, you should... But if you can't, then get a CR. Yeah, I agree. Actually, the, the, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, I think my biggest reason for try, for wanting to get a fixed unit before was because of fibroid patients. Actually, right now, I mean, yes, for fibroid patients, uh, you know, I've done pretty heavy um, or pretty, you know, fibroid patients that have a lot, you know, you know, that are like 400, 500 pounds and I've done them successfully. I cone in really well. I know where the anatomy is, so I, I don't even take a picture until I get to like, you know, close to, to close to the area. I use full contrast. I cone in really well. I mag up a little bit and I inject really hard. I mean, this is pretty much what you would do if you were doing a CR prostate um, in a patient, with, you know, using a C-arm. My issue is my back and my legs feel like crap after a uh, PAD case uh, because I'm moving the, the table constantly. Also, most tables are kind of like you know, you have the the knob on the left side so that the practitioner is actually using it or, or moving moving the table. Whereas with a fixed unit, it's on the right side so your 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 system can actually move it. I'm telling you, after a, a day with like four or five PAD cases, I feel like I was hit by, you know, with a Mack truck or by a Mack truck. And I noticed that when I leave my OBL and I go to the hospital or I go to like another site where I do like uh, procedures in a fixed in a fixed unit, I feel a lot better. So from an ergonomic standpoint alone, I think it's it's worth it. And I also think that if you execute a business plan and you're sure about your your ability to attract patients, I don't think it matters whether it's a C-arm or a fixed unit. I feel like the, the delta in the payments is not enough for you to not get a fixed unit. And this is coming from someone who has a CR. I do think the fixed unit is the best. But if you want to get into the OBL space without spending a lot of money, you can do it with, an, with, with a CR. I would agree with that with the way the companies have supported. Um, the companies were wise enough to know that the futures in OBLs, <laughs> even though a lot of people are going to hate that statement, you know, they have people who um, they want to get you the equipment that's going to be able to have you work to the best of your capability. A lot of the outpatient space is staffed by vascular surgeons and ICs. They're not doing EMBOs. So when you're hearing about C-arms, OBLs, C-arms, OBLs, they're not our people. Our people are embolization people. And mm -hmm. cancer, prostate, I don't do prostate right now because I'm just not really planning on doing it until I have a fixed unit. So you know, I, if I go, he's right with the financing, the month to month payment is not that much more. And mm. it would have opened up prostates to me. Now, Nadine Bagla et al. will say you can do these on C-arms, um, but they're really good at what they do. Like, I feel like right. I can do UFIs on a C-arm, but I think all the time if I were just first out or, you know, hadn't had such strong UFI training that I, I don't know that I would be super thrilled about it. And these are just unnecessary stressors that you feel in an OBL that you don't feel in a hospital. So the goal is to try to take those unnecessary stressors away. Like we, I wanted to be in an OBL to reduce unnecessary stressors, not to just replace them. And so, you know, I do think equipment selection and getting the best equipment, whether it's a C-arm, a table, or even an ultrasound. So I've got, I've got some things to say about ultrasound too, but Goki is right about the um, table. As I'm um, approaching the big 5-0, I've had to take a look at 
how am I going to keep doing the things I love, which is being in a cath lab. And so I um, now go to neck physical therapy <laughs> because you are moving these people and the buttons on the, the mushrooms on the left. And a lot of times, you know, you have your hand stabilizing and you're literally reaching around your back backwards because I'm doing radial and moving these tables. And it's, it's actually why I exercise and work out because you've got to keep your back strong. You've got to keep your stability. You've got to keep your balance. You've got to keep all these weird muscle groups. I mean, it's basically like Pilates during the day. And those are just the things that in the middle of the case, you can't not move the table, right? So yeah. you just have to do over and over. Um, but those are the things going into it that um, I think if you can eliminate those stressors by purchasing a nicer piece of equipment, that allows you to operate to the best of your ability as an interventional radiologist, you really should. I want to ask you guys, you know, when you reach your research buying versus leasing, obviously you can't get a used fixed unit, right? Uh, or can you? I mean, the thing is the used market, it's there. But like somebody said to me once, which I think is true, if you buy good equipment and you hold on to it until really it's outdated, right? So like yeah. if you buy, I mean, how many used, it's, it's not like the car analogy. There are right. lots full of amazing equipment because somebody decided they didn't like the table knob and they'd sent it back and you're going to get some great deal on it. So I think yeah. it's useful to spend a day looking around and asking around about used equipment, but I wouldn't hang your hat on getting some used equipment. And at that yeah. point, it's going to, I mean, with the prices the way they are, um, you know, they're coming down all the time, it seems like. So at some point, you just want to buy the new equipment um, because it also has a service warranty and all right. the other things you want that are expensive. Service warranties are expensive. So, you know, the used market, I think people talk about it a lot, but it's not as good as I think we would all hope it would be. Yeah. When you talk about used, are you talking about refurbished? Because there's also, you also have refurbished systems. Now they're not that much cheaper, but they're cheaper. You know, again, you know, as with everything, starting at OBL is a huge, huge risk. No matter how you slice it, you're, you're going to spend a lot of money. Now, once you execute your business plan and it's going okay, I, I don't think the Delta, you know, because the problem with, with used systems I've, I've, I've noticed is, you know, the place I used to lease a space, they had a lot of problems with their system. Every, maybe every two weeks it went down and then, you know, you have patients on the schedule and you can't do it because the fixed unit is not working. Um, so I, I don't know if I really encourage people to go out and use it and get used systems, maybe refurbished, but you have to really, really have a good cost savings to, to justify um, the headache you're, you're going to get down the line. And the way, the way the service contracts work is when you buy new ones, you know, you'll get a, a 24 hour service contract or something. I mean, they, they know that table time is everything, especially if you're in a single unit. So if you're in a hospital, you know, you have four rooms and everybody knows how many three months before some room goes down, they're walking around dealing with schedule. So if this is your, your, and your OBL is your only revenue generator, the difference between one day and three days is a lot. And so your service contracts yeah. talk about, and this is something you look at. So let's say um, the Zeme, which is the model that I looked into in the beginning, that you should say, where is your closest Zeme repair person located? <laughs> and, right. you know, I'm in the Pacific Northwest and they'll say, oh, he or she is in North Carolina. Well, that's going to be a problem, right? So there are other things that choose your equipment. So is there a used market? Yes or no. Or what, what equipment are you familiar with? So if you worked in a hospital with all Philips equipment, first stop should be your Philips person because then you don't have to learn a new piece of equipment. Um, likewise for Siemens. There, uh, there are distributors for all this equipment, but the reality is the companies are so good right now. Philips and Siemens, I'm less familiar with GE, but they both have um, people on their staff that help um, navigate you through this process. Um, and will be very patient and take their time with you and explain everything to you. And, you know, this equipment does change. So if it takes you two years from inception to actually have a building, the equipment's going to change. So equipment is not the first thing you want to think of out the door in terms of, I have to acquire this. You have to get real estate and you have to get contract. I mean, there's so many other things. It tends to be the thing that people think of the most because... It's the thing they know they can't live without, but it's 
it's not going to be the rate limiting step. I know for Siemens, it takes about three months from the time you place the order to get the unit made in Germany and put on a ship brought to the place. So that's the time frame, which is not the most rate limiting time frame if you're in a hospital and you want to build an OBL. Lots of other things to have happen. So well, I guess what I'm just saying is it's I don't think people should get totally stressed about the equipment from the beginning. True. And, and the companies have lots of people to help you. It's important, but it's not the most important thing. You do have companies that give good support. It actually can guide you through the stages. Philips is very good with that. They, they have um, all-inclusive kind of packages and they have their Philips Symphony suite, which was a, definitely a consideration for me when I started. Um, obviously, you know, I, I didn't get a Philips unit. I ended up getting a Siemens unit instead uh, because I felt like it had more power. But even Siemens, they have good support in my area. So I, I think you, you should definitely look for people. Support is big when you're by yourself, kind of like in an island in the wild, wild west, uh, as some people <laughs> try to call it. Um, you need good support and you, I, you can't understate that. So, so definitely when you look for it, for equipment, definitely find out people in the area who can support you, make sure the rep, the, you know, the reps are kind of, um, in the city and, or, or they have support in the city that can respond, um, when something happens, when something happens to your system. Yeah, that's, that's solid advice. And, um, uh, along those same lines, a lot of imaging vendors sounds like offer other services like consulting, helping with your build out. What's your, your experience with that? And um, are, was there anybody that stood out when it comes to that, I guess? Yeah. So I, I think that uh, Philips Symphony Suite was the leader in this, and they were thinking about this a long time ago. Siemens has a very similar program now, too, though. And they will. I mean, these those companies are wise enough to know if we want to be in on this market, we need to implant, we need to to have one of those guys like hire. So these these people are employees of the company with their sole job being to navigate through the OBL market, which the first time I yeah. heard a company did that, I was really impressed slash outstanding and slash somewhat flabbergasted that they would hire, like I wanted that job. Like all you have to do right. is is fly around and think about OBLs and people at Siemens think you're great. <laughs> but, you know, it's a natural company thing to keep their finger on the pulse of the future and then employ people who can who can do that. And I just thought that that was maybe a really relaxing job to have. And so they're full of support um, in financing construction. It is also very, very important once you pick a unit to get them involved in the construction. So where I said before, oh, don't worry about it till later. You have other things to think about. I take that back a little bit <laughs> um, because once you get the architectural drawings and the construction drawings, you really do need to make sure that your unit, you're then working very closely with the engineers um, and the company to make sure the millions of things that um, have to be perfect in order for a fixed unit to go into your, your lab have been taken care of. And that has things to do with building construction and things, details you just can't even imagine. Seal, not only like ceiling height, but the floors and the, I mean, just so many things. And so it is wise once you get your original drawings to um, then pick your machine pretty quickly and get their engineers involved. Um, and usually your architects and contractors will be working with the engineers from your your selected company. That's for fixed units, not a problem for C-arms. Yeah, so for, for C-arms, you don't have as much, you know, stuff to think about because, you know, it's a plug and play. So what they say, what they say but I was a little bit more, you know, OCD about it. I actually laid out my table where I was, where it was going to be. I also kind of mapped out where my C-arm would stay. And then I had to decide where... Uh, the outlet was going to be on the floor. So I had to figure out where it was going to sit. So that, that was, that was a part that I had to kind of um, decide. The other thing too was where my laser was going to be and where the plug for the laser was going to, was going to end. Cause you know, the, the laser requires a different um, outlet, specialized outlet. So I had to know right. kind of where that was going to get plugged in. Other than that, um, the C-arm is pretty much plug and play. So it's a lot, lot less to think about. And you could get started a little bit earlier with, with a C-arm. Whereas with a fixed unit, you have like, you know, you have to have a room for the generator and there's a lot of construction nuances you have to kind of deal with with a yeah. fixed unit. Hey, back to the listeners. This is Aaron Fritz. Before we move on with the episode, I want to tell you about a new show coming out on the Backtable Network this December. It's the Backtable Innovation Show, where hosts Brian Hartley, Eric Gantwerger, and myself will be bringing you stories from physician innovators and medtech founders who are helping to shape medicine through health tech. 
We received so much great feedback from the innovation series over the last year with episodes like the origin story of the Palma stents with Julio Palmas and starting a med tech company with Mahmoud Razavi that we decided to make a whole show dedicated to showcasing the vibrant entrepreneurial spirit of these individuals and hopefully inspire others. Keep an eye out for it wherever you get your podcast, iTunes, Spotify, or Backtable.com. And be sure to follow the new show at underscore Backtable INN on Twitter and Instagram for the latest. So we've spent a lot of time on the imaging equipment. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, disposables, device partnerships. Uh, did you guys research participating in any of these capital offset programs where you have imaging and device partnerships? You got, can you guys touch on that, Mary? So from the CRM down to disposables, there's a lot of other things in between that you would be shocked at how expensive these things are. But the disposables, you generally... The way things are right now, especially in the PAD space, is there are so many devices. It wasn't, that's it's not how it was earlier. But now for, that, I think there's probably six or seven atherectomy devices now. And so you just, as a single operator, I'm not going to have all of those. But I do have the ones that I want to use and want to think about using. So you will become a heavier user of one brand of equipment. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that makes you a sellout. I don't think that makes you anything. I think every, every IR has their preferences, yeah. whether you're in a hospital or an OBL. So you start to use your preferences. And then when your volume starts to be high enough, companies will then say to you, hey, we have these purchasing arrangements. They're not like the biggest scandal of all time. They're not going to just save you a billion dollars, right? So I do, these people have these ideas. This is all this, at least for me. I mean, there are people out there who do a lot more than I. I it, For me, I'm not one of those people. Like I do know those people out there exist that are just getting so much, so much from these companies. That is not me. I'm a single operator. I don't have that volume. I think that that wave of people that um, are just... I don't know how to say it, but, you know, that really have benefited most from these arrangements are there, but they're not the me, they're not the go case. And so we do get, we do have, a, we do have package deals with device companies, but it's not as scandalous as you might think. And that's because we're naturally using, like I use Ivis on everything because I like Ivis and I think it should be used on everything. And whether or not I have a package deal does not affect my IVIS usage because I use it on everything. And I use microcatheters for fiber and embolization on everything. And I actually honestly just found out two days ago what I pay for the microcatheter. So, you know, I'm not really like sitting around trying to figure out how to save $10, but that's just me. I also don't like to change equipment. So people will come in with a new RF catheter for veins, and it's got to save me a lot of money before I'm going to bother spending the time using it. So yes, these deals are there. I think that if you come out the door trying to seek them out, sure, you'll get some arrangement. But then when you can't hit it, you can't hit the numbers, you're going to have to deal with that headache. Just do what you do well and don't worry about like, how do I make sure for at least six months or a year? Honestly, I just don't know that if it's for me, it's just not worth the savings or whatever you're going to save to worry about that when you really should be worrying about how you're doing cases safely in an OBL. I'm the same way with you. Like, so people that want to change your technique, they learned their skills over however long they did or their mentors taught them and they went out and honed their skills somewhere else and they got to the OBL, to the OBL space. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, I can cut dollars here and here. And they use something totally different. I feel like you're going to get yourself in trouble. I use the same things I always used. I feel like it's a disservice to the patient. For me, for me personally, I use microcatheters. It is my most expensive cost in doing a UFI. I can cut my costs in half by not using microcatheter. I mean, that those things are expensive, but I believe in it. I like, I like to use it. I don't, uh, I feel like, you know, um, I like to get a little bit deeper in the uterine artery. I mean, it might be just superstition or whatnot. I feel like it, there's less cost for spasm, whatever the reason is, but I just do. And I know it costs me more, but I'm, I'm willing to kind of do that because I feel like it would make me, it would make a better result for me. 
as far as having deals with companies, I do not do deals with companies. Like it's sort of like a cadence program just because for the same reasons that Mary talked about is that I want to be able to use whatever I want. So I can use, you know, an Ivis from Philips and I can use a Navicross from, from Tumor because I like Navicross or I like whatever from, um, from another company, Merit. These deals are fine and, you know, they're designed to kind of consolidate um, disposables, which is fine and, and it helps some people. But for me personally, I wanted to use whatever. And that, that was one of the reasons why I, well, one of the, the benefits of being the OBL space is that I can use whatever I want to use. And, and I will tell you this, like my, my success rate in procedures at my OBL is higher than when I'm in any other person space or in the hospital, because I have exactly what I want. I use a lot of, um, um, Sapera stents, knowing full and well that Sapera stents are one of the more expensive stents you can use because I believe it can help in certain instances. So I think, you know, you know, cadence programs are good. They're designed to kind of help people kind of offset capital equipment. And there are some people that can, that will benefit from it. Maybe for instance, now, like I would say that Philips has a, a good cadence system, which is something to look into. It, they have like a whole symphony, symphony uh, suite system or, or, or kind of like set up. Um, I know Siemens has one with Boston Scientific and Boston Scientific is a good OBL partner because they have several things you can use both for UVs and PA, PAE, but also with um, PAD stuff. So that's a good, a good partnership. I personally don't involve in, you know, myself in cadence programs just because I use so many different things and I didn't feel like it would help me. So, you know, if someone asked me, well, how do you offset the price of, uh, of the capital equipment? I always tell them, I say, well, first of all, you know, OBLs are risky. So if you're doing it, better have a good business model. And if your only strategy to offset costs and make money is by getting, getting into a cadence system, then you're, you're in the wrong business. Get what you want and use what you want. And, um, and that's what I tell them. I also don't think that the amount of money that is, you're, you're going to get offsetting that is that much for you to kind of um, change your entire, your, your entire technique. Yogi is very right about if your um, way to make it an OBL is to be on these programs, then you've got a problem. I would say where your equipment costs can come into play is in if you're not sparingly use them as much as possible, which means you're just not thinking about them, right? So if you're using twice as, twi like if, if Goke is using four microcatheters per embolization, then he's going to have a problem. But it doesn't mean don't use the microcatheter, it just means don't use four microcatheters. So I would say that you, you do need to be efficient and um, directed and good at what you do. But Goke is right that if it comes down to a, a program, then you probably shouldn't be building an OBL. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least in my experience early on where we didn't have the, the funds to stock the shelves with, with everything under the sun, it was kind of like, you know, it was, it was all about planning. I knew I had these cases this week. I knew what I would need for these cases. I planned it out and I had my rep bring his trunk stock out so that we exactly. had what we needed for that day for that case. And that was a good way to transition to the point where you then have, you know, you're successful enough where you can actually start stocking the shelves with, you know, and, and maybe enter into a, a singular program around one device for one procedure, stuff like that. You know, for example, the Venus ablation stuff, you know, they have program, you know, all those companies, Medtronic, Banklose, they have programs where you use so many other catheters, then they throw in a generator, stuff like that. And I think that those kinds of programs are helpful to research when you are fig trying to plan out what procedure, what services you're going to offer, what procedure, procedures you're going to perform in your OBL. So I wanted to kind of like, and this actually isn't, I, I want to make sure we, we talk about this before we leave, because I'm a very um, tactful and shrewd negotiator. I think that I asked around and I try to figure out what people paid. So once you get an idea of what something should cost, I really think you should challenge companies to, to give you a good price. There, there's this thing that the, the industry always talks about a race to zero, but you know, you definitely don't want to be in the high end when you're paying for equipment. So, so the first thing I did was I talked to my company. I said, look, you, you got to give me the best price. You can get like demo units. Um, that's another strategy. Demo units typically, typically come very loaded with every single option, um, which is something that I got and I thought it was great, but also like, um, 
by, by putting in these cadence programs, I feel like sometimes you don't even get the best prices. You know, the, the prices you, you'll be in a cadence program, but like, well, you know, they're giving you rebates that offset, offsets the capital equipment, but you're not getting the best prices anyways. You know, so, you know, I, I felt like earlier on, I felt like that was the, the most important thing was to get the best price for my equipment and get the best price for my, for my disposables and not worry about cadence programs. Now, however, though, I, I do recognize that cadence programs do work for some people. I'm just saying for me personally, I decided to approach it a different way. The other thing too about equipment or disposables is I try to get the majority of my things, my, my disposables on consignment. I think that having um, consignments kind of like cuts your risk. You don't have to stock stuff. And I think that it's hard to predict what you're going to use at each, each given time. Um, right now I do have some things that are not on consignment and it's really a pain because I have to anticipate what I'm going to, what I'm going to use, how much I'm going to use. And I feel like there's opportunities for waste. So I feel like, you know, even if it costs you a little bit more to do consignments, I typically lean towards consignment because then consignment becomes a controlled cost. And so if you're doing a PAD case or a UFI case, you already have an expectation of what the reimbursement is going to be. So it, it's pretty much an, a, a, a contained cost. So consignment for my disposables and, you know, like I think wires and catheters, you, you can't consign those. So you can buy those and just buy them piecemeal, buy just what you need to cover you for maybe the next couple months. Don't go crazy. Um, don't tie your capital on disposables because you're going to need you're going to need that to, to meet payroll, et cetera, et cetera. But, but definitely consignment definitely works. And then I do have some, some, you know, actually I just did a case the other day, which is a, an ovarian vein embolization and I don't have a single coil in my office. I should because as an IR, right? Because if someone gets in trouble, I need to coil something. Um, I, I should have it, but I don't. But for those cases, I have the rep bring their coils and because they don't consign those coils. The cook rep does not consign those reps, I mean, those coils. So I have them bring it in for that case. And, and they just, they just charge me for whatever I use. Well, cool. So this has been a great conversation about equip capital equipment, disposables. I let's touch on ultrasound before we finish up, because that is a hot topic right now. And, um, having gone through that process, having looked at different, um, you know, options. I know that the prices can be all over the place and it's not cheap, right? So, uh, Mary, what's your, uh, approach to ultrasound equipment? My approach to ultrasound equipment is to similar to my approach to the rest of the equipment is get the things that you need to be the best that you can be. And I say that having had a piece of equipment recently that was a, you know, a $50,000 piece of equipment instead of a $110,000 piece of equipment. And really, it just limits you. You know, these mobile handheld ultrasounds may be good for, you know, a vein clinic, but that's it. But when I have patients come for, to me and like I had a gal that I did it, uh, what I do, a thor thoracentesis on her maybe like six years ago. And now she needs um, bilateral percutaneous nephrostomies. So I want to be able to do everything I can do in my OBL that's safe to do in an OBL. And I don't want to say, I, you know, I'm an IR and I can do everything an IR does. Oh, but wait, I can't do X, Y, or Z because my equipment's not up to par. Then you're forcing people to try to figure out what you do and what you don't do. So my general philosophy is just be able to do everything you can do. And, you know, the, the way these companies have financing packages, so the monthly outlay is not that bad. I think that if you're in an OBL space and you are really nervous about debt and being, you know, having a lot of debt, then maybe a, maybe an employed position in a hospital or somewhere else is great for you. But if you're going to do this, you have to acquire the debt of the practice. And like Oke said earlier, if you have a good business plan, it, it should pan out and all make sense. But I just think you don't want to be limited. It's how you do things effectively and safely. And I've used both the high and the low ends of equipment and I'm firmly standing on get the high-end equipment. I will also say that it, that um, extends itself to the things like monitors, which things you don't think about. Nursing monitors, they're six or $7,000 each. It's like furnishing a house, right? You move into a new house and you think the big house purchase is the purchase, but really you're also then need $150,000 worth of furniture. So 
you know, because those brass um, shower handles aren't going to pay for themselves, Aaron. <laughs> so, you know, things like things like monitors and I don't know, computers and everything else adds a lot of expense. So getting a real idea of what your equipment cost is, is not at all just limited to your uh, C-arm or your fixed unit and your table and your ultrasound. Those are your big, your big ones. Unless you're planning on putting in a CT or nobody puts in an MRI, but there are some people who put in a CAT scan, CAT scanner. It's a whole other topic. Well, it's funny you say that, Mary, because Lincoln Patel, a friend and colleague here in Dallas, is building an OBL, and he uh, wanted me to ask you guys, have you considered <laughs> CT? Uh, because he's planning on, I think, having CT because he wants to do everything an IR does. He wants to do biopsies and CT-guided ablations and so, stuff like it that. It takes a lot of biopsies to pay off a CT machine. A lot. The, like more than you would probably do. But you can, Mike Cumming got a CT scanner. I would oh, advise everybody okay. call Mike Cumming. But, you know, he's in a, <laughs> he's in a partnership with some people that it, where it made sense. Are they doing diagnostic? I mean, I guess his point is you can do pre and post procedure imaging as well. You know, and uh, help your referring docs out. But yeah, I don't know if need, there's. You need to have yeah. the CT running constantly to get yeah. to, to, to make it worth it. Uh, um, even MRIs. I, I thought about it one time because I I sent out a lot of you know all my UV patients get MRIs because I've tried to go away from it, but Mary mm -hmm. doesn't. Um, I won't allow I it. Should <laughs> go away. <I'm> <laughs> so um, I do a lot. I send a lot out, and um, and maybe twice or three times more than procedures I actually do because a lot of them, you know, may not even need anything from me. It's just more counseling and directing them. And I was like, you know, it'd be cool if I had an MRI, I could just do it. But honestly speaking, if you're not, if you don't have your MRI churning at all times, then it's really not worth it. Yeah. So. And that's a great place to so, partner. Yeah. Right. And I, I would say if John Littman doesn't have his MRI, probably none of us should, <laughs> given the volume right? that he does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a great place to partner. There's also so many uh, rules and regulations around referrals and imaging. And I mean, you just right. have to be very, right. very careful. And before you get into any sort of diagnostics, you know, consulting a healthcare attorney to make sure everything's on the up and up. It gets very dicey and it's very um, profession by profession. So nephrologists versus what cardiologists can do versus what IR can do is all very different. So I, I am petrified enough by this that if I have at the first thought of getting a CT, I would consult a healthcare attorney and tell them my plan and make sure there's no, no issues with it. Got it. We're at the, about the hour, we're over the hour. And, uh, this has been a great discussion. Any last words from you guys? Any, uh, final words of advice for our listeners? Go, okay, I'll start with you. I would say that doing an OBL is not for everyone. You know, I learned that my first day um, out, I, I felt like, you know, this is, uh, you know, I think my first week out, I was like, now I understand why a lot of people don't do it. You know, that being said, there are a lot of perks to being in, you know, in, in this space, um, having kind of, um, being able to kind of, I guess, call your own shots and be your own boss. It is definitely fulfilling to me. There are a lot of headaches to go with it. Right now, we're dealing with crazy, crazy human resources issues. I mean, it's not even, it's to the point where it's starting to give me headaches uh, and, and sleepless nights. You can't hire people and the cost of labor is, is, has gone up. Um, so it's not something that is, is definitely not why I wanted to be a doctor to, to deal with this. I, I wanted to just kind of take care of patients. And then, you know, and then you, you, you try to hire a manager. I mean, the manager also has the same issues that you were having. So it doesn't really solve the problem. Right. So I would say definitely, you know, if you want to get into this space, definitely talk to someone like us. Um, I definitely, you know, had a lot of, you know, I bothered a lot of people, including Mary, you know, and, and I felt like I couldn't do it without someone kind of telling me, you know, what their experience was, uh, was like. And, and uh, I think you should definitely feel free to reach out to one of us. And I know that there are people that I reached out to that have not, um, that did not respond. Um, Mary's not one of them, obviously, Thank but you. I, I know redeemed. that everybody, <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody that reached out to me, I took time and I talked to them extensively and they still text me to this day. So, um, I, I believe that we have to help IRs, uh, be successful. Um, I feel like, you know, IRs need to just take over the world. Um, and I really do fundamentally believe in it. And so that's why I'm very motivated to help IRs succeed. Thank you. Okay. Mary, any final words for the back table listeners? 
Well, I, I think that where it comes to equipment, it would be, um, I, I remember having a yellow pad of paper. I think this was circa 2013, where I decided I started off the bat thinking I'm going to learn equipment because I did what everybody else does, which is I'm going to start with what piece of equipment should I buy? And I went to GE, I went to Philips, I went to Zeem, I went to Siemens, and I had all these detailed notes on all of the different bells and whistles and just everything. And by the time I got to the end of the list, the beginner of the list had a new piece of equipment. And so I just basically could have gone around and around and around trying to sort out every little thing about every piece of equipment. And, it, and I'd probably still be writing on a yellow pad of paper, not having moved along if I didn't just say, forget it. I'm just picking one, closing my eyes and picking one. So I guess the advice would be don't have FOMO over your equipment and go to as many different labs as you can see, as you can and touch and feel everything. And then you'll know what to buy. I would agree with the FOMO thing. I think FOMO is the worst part about our specialty right now is everybody's just feels like they're missing out yeah. on something. And, you know, it took me going through a couple of failures and getting back to, and granted, I, I come back to part-time, but I now kind of appreciate being back in the hospital a little bit because after having been in the OBL space, there's, the grass is not greener on either side, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think it just all depends on what I was striving for was autonomy. And I imagine that's what you guys wanted. Uh, that's a huge part of your decision as well, but you can find autonomy in the hospital with your practice. It's just a matter of exploring different options. But uh, you guys, I think, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I know our audience is going to appreciate this, uh, this information. I've got a good story. Sure. Let's tell it. Okay. Uh, well, I think that Goki and I feel pretty strongly about equipment. We went to the last meeting. I think it was ICIT in Florida. I can't really remember what it was. Um, but we went, um, we were meeting with the Siemens people and talking about their equipment. And the thing that the two of us liked the best that we spent, no lie, about 45 minutes talking about was the little metal foot rod on the pedal. And you could slip your foot in there and pick it up and pull oh, it back. Yeah. And I was like yeah. a soccer player. I have like a lot of leg motion happening at the cat lab. And I always pick that thing up and I kind of move it around and I like dance yeah, around. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And so we, I, dis I discovered his love of the foot lifter thing. And he discovered my love of it and we didn't, we couldn't stop talking about it. And it was just a great example to the um, designer people at Siemens of how these little things make all the difference. Cause I would, I would buy a ta I would not buy a table based on whether or not they had that little foot pickup thing. The oh, foot wow. Bar. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So it was, it was a bonding moment. I know. I love that. <laughs> it's funny that you guys mentioned that because there's somewhere where I go where, where mm -hmm. it's this big, huge thing and you have to kick it to get it to go anywhere. And, the, and like, <laughs> I didn't even realize, like, you're right. Like the foot pedal picker upper thing is yeah. like yes. key. Yeah. To, and a light yeah, pedal that you can move it. And then yeah. that stupid button in the middle that everyone just says, just hit the button in the middle, do a single shot. And you're trying to put your foot yeah. through the plastic to like step on this like targeted <laughs> thing way up at the high. And I'm like, no, I never do that. I use a left pedal or a right pedal. I'm not using yeah. 12 pedals. Yep. Left, right, right, and the picker upper thing, and single image goes with my, my left need. hand as single image. Yeah, there's nothing yeah. when they have the like multiple buttons at the top. That's the dumbest design ever right. because your foot right. can't I slip agree. through that plastic. Yeah, it can. Yeah. Cool. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Zubi Syed, Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Vivek Prasad. Social media and PR by Anne Dang and newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.